you want to understand current social and economic development in Central and Eastern Europe a bit better, this video might be for you. Today I uploaded a book presentation that took place on October 26, 2021 in Leipzig. It's a presentation of a book that has a rather long origin story, but let's start from the beginning. In November 2018, Dr. Uwe Müller from the Leibniz Institute for the History and Culture of Eastern Europe, Dirk Langolf from the Fraunhofer Center for International Management and Knowledge Economy, and I, back then I was Theodor Lühn Fellow of the Humboldt Foundation and worked in Paris, we organized a conference. The title of the conference was Transforming the Transformation, Social Economic Development in Central and Eastern Europe. Uwe Müller and I were both members of the Expert Commission on Social Economic Sciences of the Johann Gottfried Herder Research Council. This Expert Commission organizes conferences on a yearly basis on various topics, and the conference of 2018 was one of them. The quality of the presented papers was very high, and they inspired Uwe and me to start a book project with the title The Middle Income Trap in Central and Eastern Europe, Emergence and Ways Out. The book project was financially supported by the Leibniz Science Campus Eastern Europe Global Area and in May 2021 we could send the entire manuscript to the publisher Bergheim Books. The texts have 14 contributors, 5 of which already took part in the conference in 2018, 9 joined the project later. Currently the manuscript is in a review, yet we still decided to ask Kirill Kosev from the OECD in Paris, Jigesh Lechowski from the Berlin Social Science Center and Daniel Schittera from the Charles University in Prague to come to Leipzig and give a short presentation of their papers. The video that starts after my short introduction here starts with Dr. Steffen Preisler and Lena Dellywater. Dr. Steffen Preisler also works for the Fraunhofer Center for International Management and Knowledge Economy. Lena Dellywater is coordinator of the Leibniz Science Campus Eastern Europe Global Area. Their short introductory speeches will be followed by Uwe Müller and me. Uwe will explain the makings of the book, how the book came to be. After him, I will explain what the book is actually about. What is the middle income trap? What does it mean? What does it stand for? Why do we think that this book is a contribution to current research? Why do we think this book is crucial to better understand what's currently going on in Central and Eastern Europe? After that, Kira Kosev, Zsigas Lekowski and Dan Shitera will present their papers. We are convinced that this video and the book itself are going to find your interest. Down below in the video description, you will find links to the contributors, the preliminary table of contents and also additional information. If you have any questions or remarks, please feel free to use the comment section below. I hope we will meet in my next video. Thank you and goodbye. We are inside the Kupferstahl lounge, but also outside there. Whoever um, will follow us um, here on this channel. Um, a warm welcome to the book presentation The Middle Income Trap in Central and Eastern Europe Emerging and Ways Out. Um, may I introduce uh, the speakers um, tonight? Uh, first, we will have a short welcome message uh, from Steffen Preisler. He's from the Fraunhofer EMW, then Miss Lena Dalliwater for EGA. And uh, afterwards, uh, we uh, have those who are working very hard uh, to make this real what we are pre pre presenting tonight. Um, first, uh, Uwe Müller, and second, uh, Yaman Kuli. Um, they will be the publisher uh, of editors. And uh, also, as uh, um, those who uh, deliver edit, edits to this wonderful book, uh, is uh, Kirill Kosev, Daniel Citerra, and uh, Szegor Lechowski. So, wonderful to be uh, um, the host here, but uh, wonderful that you are our guests tonight. And the first, uh, who will say hello is uh, Steffen Preisler, and uh, the floor is yours, Steffen. Thank you very much. I was asked to give a warm welcome speech, and I'm very happy to to give you such a speech introduction. Um, 
I was told to, to make it in German, so I prepared it in German. Um, so, sehr geehrte Damen und Herren, liebe Gäste, liebe Kolleginnen und Kollegen, um, ich darf es heute ganz herzlich hier im Kupfersaal in Leipzig begrüßen. Anlässlich eines gemeinsamen Publikationsvorhabens. Ausgangspunkt des Vorhabens war eine gemeinsame internationale Konferenz, die wir vor einigen ja, zweieinhalb Jahren fast schon hier in Leipzig organisiert haben. In diesem Zusammenhang möchte ich namentlich begrüßen Frau Delwater, Hallo. Äh, Dr. Kirill Kosev von der OECD Paris, Dr. Jamon Kuli von der Heinrich-Heine-Universität in Düsseldorf, Dr. Grzegorz Lekowski vom Wissenschaftszentrum Berlin für Sozialforschung, Dr. Wimmler vom Leibniz-Institut für Geschichte und Kultur des östlichen Europas hier in Leipzig und Dr. Daniel Schitera von der Karls universität in Prag, Institut für internationale Beziehungen. Ganz herzlichen Dank Ihnen allen äh, und ebenso unserem Leiter der Abteilung Marketing und Kommunikation, Dirk Langholz. Dirk, vielen Dank. Bevor ich gleich das Wort weitergebe, möchte ich nur gern in Erinnerung rufen, dass es bei Publikationsvorhaben zwei tolle und aufregende Momente, Situationen, Zeitpunkte gibt. Einen solchen Zeitpunkt stellt zunächst äh, der Beginn des Vorhabens dar, wenn Fragestellungen klar werden, wenn sich Schreibteams finden, ähm, wenn gemeinsam Pläne geschmiedet werden. Und dann kommt diese Aufgabenzeit, bei der geschrieben wird, wo Reviews gegeben werden, wenn es Feedback gibt, wenn die Texte überarbeitet werden und wenn es erneut eine Schleife gibt mit den Editoren und den Reviewern. Und der zweite erfreuliche Zeitpunkt ist dann, wenn das Manuskript steht. Und wenn dieser Zeitpunkt zusätzlich mit einem Zusammenkommen mit einem gemütlichen Abend zusammenfällt, ist es umso schöner. Letzten Endes ist ein solch, solches Publikationsvorhaben immer auch äh, ein gemeinsamer Raum für persönlichen Austausch, für gemeinsame Entwicklung und auch gemeinsame Erkenntnisse. In diesem Sinne wünsche ich Ihnen und uns allen heute einen sehr spannenden, gemütlichen, erkenntnisreichen und wissensintensiven Abend. Herzlich willkommen und eine schöne Veranstaltung. Thank you, Stefan and uh, Rima Dami Water for the Leibniz Science Campus Eastern Europe Global Area. I hope I'm uh, on track. Yes, uh, you're fully on track and a uh, warm welcome also on behalf of exactly this, this Leibniz Science Campus Eastern Europe Global Area, who is a co organizer and co sponsor of this event. Also, um, many thanks from our side for all your efforts, your input, um, thanks to the editors to following up on this exciting workshop and to make this publication project happen. I hope that there will be many more exciting moments in this process um, when you finally have the book in your hands and when you toast like with your family and friends on it, for example, and I'm looking forward to the event uh, tonight. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And now I hand over to Uwe Müller, and uh, one of the editors is now speaking to you. Okay. Well, thanks, Dirk, for the introduction. Welcome also from my side. Uh, I'm, after all, an economic historian and not a specialist in current development in economics. And therefore, today I would like to say something about the genesis of this manuscript. Uh, the idea to hold a conference on the problem of the middle income trap originally came from Yaman Kuli. Like me, Yaman Kuli is also a member of the Expert Commission Economic and Social Sciences within the Herder Research Council, Fachkommission Wirtschaft und Sozialwissenschaften, Herder Forschungsrat in German. This Herder Research Council is in turn an association of experts that promotes research and conferences on the history but also on the society, economy and culture of East Central Europe. The Expert Commission assessed Yaman's concept positively and provided financial support 
for holding the conference in November 2018. It wasn't exactly. Additional funding was provided by EGA or EGA. The conference was organized by the team led by Dirk Bertner Langol from the IMW, where it also took place here uh, uh, in the neighborhood. My institute, the Gewitz at Ober, was also involved. The title uh, of uh, the conference at that time was uh, Transforming the Transformation, Economic and Social Development in Central and Eastern Europe. Um, okay. Uh, okay, it works because I have here another window with Microsoft Teams. Okay, I'm uh, <laughs> Yes. Um, Yaman and I choose this title because, firstly, it points to the fundamental problem. The transformation from a plan to a market economy has reached a certain point of completion in the Eastern European countries at different times in each case, I would say. Uh, this means, of course, that even in those countries where the transformation was successful from an economic point of view, especially in the East Central European countries and in Poland, uh, Czech Republic, Slovakia and Hungary, the economic policy strategies, but also the action of companies had to be uh, realigned. This was all the more true because the transformation also had some side effects uh, that were dangerous for the stability of the societies. By this, I mean above all the increase in social, but also in regional inequalities within the states. So, uh, at the conference, we tried firstly to stay, take stock of the transformation process and secondly to outline the economic tasks that the states already faced or that are currently facing at the end of the transformation process. Thirdly, we felt it was necessary to have an interdisciplinary discussion. That means to include not only economists, but also political scientists, sociologists, geographers, and economic historians. Uh, here's a, a brief uh, summary of the conference program. Uh, um, the, the, the keynote address uh, was uh, made by the German, I would say, Grandmaster of Economic Transformation Research, Hans-Jürgen Wagner from Frankfurt Oder. And we had uh, also uh, uh, 13 lectures. Um, it may be interesting for colleagues in the audience who publish books themselves or plan to do so in the future to learn that, that six of these 13 lectures also resulted in contributions for the book. Of the remaining speakers, some had no interest in publishing, others suggested colleagues with more expertise or and or interest, and another group was not asked by us to contribute. In the course of evaluating uh, the conference and preparing the publication, Yaman and I decided that the potential publication can only be competitive alongside other publication on the economic development of Eastern Europe if it focuses on a specific problem, but at the same time preserve uh, the interdisciplinarity of perspectives. This was, by the way, also recommended by the reviewers uh, uh, of the, uh, our expose we sent to the publishing house Berkhan Books. With this in mind, we approached other authors. During this time, there were commitments, some of which were later revoked, problems with meeting deadlines, in other words, the usual business of editorial work. The majority of the 11 articles, including the introduction, have been proofread by Dennis Boskurt. We would like to thank IGA again for their financial support and the Fraunhofer Institute for taking over the proofreading of the remaining articles. In the end, we hope we have succeeded in putting together a volume that cannot claim to be complete, but we think that it takes important perspectives and also presents contributions that complement each other. Yaman and I have tried to make these mutual connections clear in the introduction of the volume. And uh, here you find uh, 
the first slide uh, is a table uh, of uh, content uh, of the uh, uh, manuscript. Um, yes, at, if you look at the table of contents, we see three focal points. At the beginning, we have a kind of historical balance sheet of the transformation process, whereby Yaman Kuli's contribution still goes back to the communist period, but concentrates on one country, Poland, while Tal Kadaya tries to measure the success of the transformation for a large group of states with the help of several indicators. Secondly, case studies are presented in which case refers to a specific industry and or a specific country. Besides Grzegorz Lepowski's analysis of Polish IT multinationals, which he will present in a moment, we have here a contribution by Cornel Bann and uh, Zoltan Mihai on the possibilities and limits of uh, FDI-led growth in Romania. An article by Iliana Madina and Stretten Preisler uh, on attempts by Bulgarian institutions to implement modern technologies and promotes a transition to a knowledge economy. In addition, the article by Birgit uh, Glorius provides information on the hopes and opportunities, disappointments and risks associated with return migration to Bulgaria. This study is based on interviews with migrants and thus is one example for the diversity of methods we used in this uh, book. And last but not least, certainly the role of the European Union is examined. This involves both the influence of the EU on the path of transformation that has been taken with all its advantages and disadvantages and the potential of the EU to promote the structural change that is now necessary. I don't want to go into this in detail because we are in the fortunate situation that we have two authors here who also view the role of the EU more or less critically. Finally, I come back to the genesis of the book. We sent the manuscript across the Atlantic in May 2021. So we expect the reaction from the reviewers soon. After that, there will certainly be some work to do. I hope that we will also get some suggestions for improvements at this event today. Thank you. Thank you, Uwe. Um, I think you uh, will be followed by a wonderful presenter too. It's also <laughs> technical uh, a theme, so yeah, oh, it's your theme also. And uh, I'm looking forward to, uh, to your presentation too, after uh, the historical background to the manuscript by Uwe. And now, okay, that's additionally from you. Oh, don't say anything. But, um, Second to test if you are uh, obviously. <laughs> oh, there we are. Uh, While well, the middle income trap in Central and Eastern Europe emerges, and ways out, which my role is a, a bit to present the logic behind the book. And uh, I'd like to start with a definition you won't find in any book, but I still think it's appropriate. Um, the economies in the middle income trap are stuck between a rock and a hard place. Uh, they are too expensive to be considered cheap. So that if they want to attract foreign direct investments, uh, it actually one strategy to do so is to be cheap. But well, the more an economy develops, the less it is cheap. The more it becomes expensive, so the, the harder to compete to uh, to compete for foreign direct investment via low prices. At the same time, they are not innovative enough to justify high wages and costs. And that leads to a situation where, in my opinion, there's no way out. It's, a, it's hard to find a way out. And uh, at, that's an important problem um, to be analyzed for at least three reasons. I call them here problems. Um, I hope I can specify why. The first one might be, look a bit strange, but it's growth. Actually, that's the name of the game. You want to develop, if you attract foreign direct investment, what you want to do is to uh, generate economic growth, higher wages, higher welfare standards, and so on. But the thing is, but that higher GDP per capita leads necessarily to 
higher wages, higher labor costs, and so on. That is, there must be a threshold beyond which being attractive for foreign direct investment becomes more difficult. Where this threshold exactly is, it's hard to say. One, some people say $1,000 uh, per year, others 16000 Actually, that's not the, the, the core problem, in my opinion. The problem is that one day, the day will come where being attractive for foreign debt investors because, one, because the country is cheap doesn't work anymore. And that leads, but actually this trap is unavoidable. And that problem leads to well, volatility and social pride, or could also say uh, contradicting uh, incentives. Because at least in theory, foreign direct investments are very volatile. The idea is, or the theory that an investor can always take his money, his capital, and leave for another country. That is a very theoretical assumption. One cannot change the location of country and capital at zero costs. But it's always possible that a country, that in theory, an investor says, well, conditions aren't good enough for me anymore here, so I will leave. And, and already this fear provides an incentive for governments to, to do they, what they can to keep costs be, uh, below a certain limit. And there are two different prices for this, um, uh, for this kind of policy. One, actually low wages, which can cause, uh, can cause certain problems. But second, being attractive, having attractive labor laws doesn't, doesn't just mean there are low wages. That also means that you have um, labor laws which, provide, which, uh, which allow employers to quickly hire and fire people. They keep social spending at a low level. They keep syndicates, trade, trade, uh, uh, trade unions, labor unions at bay. In fact, what, uh, all these pesky uh, attempts to be able to, um, well, to negotiate with employers are kept at bay via laws. And at a certain point, they have always this route that this leads to social problems. And the third, another incentive that is linked with this kind of policy is that to, to keep costs low, you have to keep taxes low, so you have to keep government, governmental spending low. But in the long run, that's actually not what you want to do. If you want to develop an innovative, knowledge-based economy, you have to start to invest. Um, High-speed internet, research and development, social policy, welfare state, all that what you need. Even just to make people stay in your country, because the more they are they're educated, the more they are the sphere, especially in the European Union, they just leave for another country. And well, they often promise to come back, but usually they don't. So actually, there's uh, these two contradicting incentives. There is in the short term, there are the incentives to stay cheap. In the long run, you want, but you, you want, actually want to invest to improve your economy and the foundation, the infrastructure of the economy. And that's actually the trap. Um, and that leads to a third problem um, that, uh, um, actually, a third conclusion Uwe and I arrived at when we read the, the contribution to the, to the edited volume. There seems, to be, uh, there seems to be a political trap, because what I just described could be considered as the downsides of globalization. And these downsides seem to have paved the way for political, for popular political parties uh, to exploit uh, the situation and provide relatively simple answers to the problem. In Poland, you have uh, clearly a populist party which has uh, started to do what uh, some publicists uh, call bank nationalism. Um, in Hungary, you have a similar situation, even though this policy isn't actually the way out. So we will see whether that works in the long run. There are authors who are convinced that um, Actually, these other economies are going to grow through this middle-income trap into a knowledge growth economy. I'm not so sure. Actually, if we want to, this phenomenon is not exactly limited to uh, to Central Eastern Europe. When you look at England, they, if we want, uh, they tried a sort of dis economic disintegration by closing their labor market. The support behind Donald Trump would also um, uh, actually lay, lay in, a, uh, in a part of the society which was struck by uh, by the downside of globalization, economic, uh, uh, international economic competition. So actually, there's good reason to link these two phenomena. Downside of globalization, middle income trap on the one hand, even if the regional one, and populist parties. And that's why the problem isn't just an economical one, it's also a social political one. 
Thank you. Thank you very point. Um, and uh, after this paradigma uh, uh, discussion <laughs> interview, uh, um, Kirill Kosev is uh, one of uh, the editors uh, who delivered something uh, special. And uh, <laughs> you prepared a presentation too? Yes. And now we are listening to you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Let me see if I'm as technically savvy. <laughs> and uh, I am uh, trying to make the mouse. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm not sure if the mouse works very well. My finger is not working well. Ah, sorry. Uh, this one? Yes. The most. I promise the last uh, total of my cost today. Okay, no, perfect. perfect. Yeah. And if I can take a mask, thank you. Well, I will try to be as brief, as concise as Yaman. It's difficult to choose to, to feel. But uh, let me first uh, thank, of course, uh, the editors, uh, Uwe Müller and Yaman Kauli and all their colleagues for organizing this, but also for putting together the upcoming book, uh, I, of course, I think it will be an excellent upcoming volume, but they've gone through a difficult uh, time and difficult process and they sincerely deserve praise. So thank you very much for this. Uh, look, we already touched quite a few of the notes that I will actually discuss, but uh, I will say a few statements throughout the presentation of what the chapter, of course, des describes. And uh, I will strongly encourage everybody interested to read the book and read the chapter, of course. But effectively, let me start with this statement that the Eastern European transformation into open market economies has been a success. Uh, the three decades since 1989 have seen the former command economies uh, develop into open markets, into open to finance and trade. There has not been backtracking on the economic side. This has resulted in a successful growth in living standards and consumption opportunities. And of course, it was all underpinned by the desired inflows of Western technology and Western capital. So these were the two key economic factors behind the opening. And the path has been integration to the global value chains, largely EU focused for Eastern Europe and uh, with the promise of catch up growth. And here is a little picture of what this uh, success has been. So the first, th 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 these charts, you can just uh, it will take a long time to go through them, but you can see that there's sort of a couple of two, a couple of periods. You know, the promise of fast catch-up growth was there in the early 2000s. There was uh, effectively rapid growth, which resulted in a, a sharp absorption of foreign investment and technological spillovers. However, linking to mostly European Union uh, economic and financial patterns has also contributed to domestic volatility within Eastern European economies. Uh, this has exposed them to Western financial volatility and to widening economic uh, inequalities. Especially the, the sharp global financial crisis of 2008 and 9 is a case in point. It directly linked to, to, through to Eastern Europe. Some other uh, issues are discussed in the chapter which are probably as important, so destruction of pre-1989 industrial centers and trade links, uh, limited demand for pre-existing skills, considerable arbitrage opportunities for insiders, which have distorted sort of competitive markets. Uh, uh, and of course, uh, a big elephant in the room this is a large scale migration, which has meant skills shortages in Eastern Europe in certain regions in particular, and has contributed to political instability on both sides of, 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 of this, uh, if you like, of, of this region. It is, I would say it's debatable if there was a break point, if we can even call it a break point, if this was the global financial crisis, but the macroeconomic uh, catch-up growth has certainly slowed down. There's, a, I show a nice scale of difference between pre-2008 and nine and, and, and after. And, and that matters because it means it will take considerably longer time until living standards of Eastern Europeans reach the West, which was obviously the promise everybody was looking for in the very early 90s. 
And I would say towards the end of the chapter, I argue that if Eastern European economies would continue on their convergence process, they would need to think very hard and policymakers in the region will need to think very hard of changing the growth model of simply opening up and relying on foreign investment and technological change. So there is a, so, so there's another statement I wanted to mention is that while the macroeconomic su success is there, and I think it should be, uh, I mean, we should really acknowledge that, it is not unqualified. And Yaman already mentioned, uh, and I think Uwe also mentioned a little bit uh, inequalities, especially the regional story is very, very important, both for economic success, but also for the political instability that I mentioned already. So at microeconomic level, open market transformation has produced fairly narrow uh, economic uh, success. Mm. Many, if not most, regions outside of the metropolitan capital areas have basically become economically inefficient for the new economic times. They have all infrastructure, low educational attainment, low technological ad adoption, and people migrate out of them. So this disparity is not conducive to further convergence. And as Yaman, I think, quite rightly pointed, it may well prove to be an important break towards exiting a potential middle income trap. In fact, this, I argue that this big emerging regional disparities may well be channeling these economies into a middle income trap. So the shortcomings, uh, let me let me discuss a little bit the shortcomings of, of the existing model and uh, why it needs to be changed. So the problem of this uh, slowdown and catch-up growth is that the early rapid gains have dissipated a little bit now, and but they have not delivered Western income levels, Western institutional development or stability that this institutional development brings, but they have actually delivered Western levels of inequality which pushes towards instability. The left behind regions have considerably higher unemployment, despite outward migration. They have lower access to ubiquitous modern technologies. That means that connectivity is low and there are very low opportunities to, to join the new knowledge economy of the 21st century. So, so the opportunities that this type of economy uh, allows. And they exhibit lower trust in institutions and political systems. And importantly, the people who live in this region, they self-identify with lower life satisfaction and lower quality of life. So really, in conclusion, I would say that a new path is probably needed. And one path could be a more broad-based and inclusive growth, which can channel investment into education and connectivity. It can seek to develop existing and novel technological, uh, sorry, knowledge sectors and new technologies. Because the old industrial sectors, they will not be returning uh, into economic life. Global manufacturing has already moved decisively, compared to advantage, has moved decisively towards Southeast Asia. And new sectors of, of uh, growth are emerging in Western Europe itself, which seek to utilize green technologies, the new digital domain, to solve the European Union's own problems of economic inequality and uneven growth. So the countries of Eastern Europe can only benefit if they continue to integrate, cooperate institutionally, and seek to compete economically in these new domains. So really, in conclusion, I would say that the EU is a good thing and should continue to be a good thing for these economies. And with this, uh, I would leave uh, it. I mean, it's okay. Yeah, okay. You're doing pretty well. No, no. <laughs> I'm trying very hard. So, hopefully, I will somehow find my. That's the test of the intelligence, and I don't think I will pass. So, could you help me? <laughs> So let's start with it. There's always, there's always a helping message. <laughs> oh, you're limiting hours. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, that's me. So meanwhile, I would like to thank you that you invited me into the project and into the book. And I hope this will be a successful project in the end, or I believe for. And uh, also thank my previous presenters because they explained the contents very well. So it will 
be easier now to stick to the limit that I, uh, I'm supposed to uh, to fill. And I will start it, uh, with a topic that I will today will be talking about the sort of like two dependencies, which sort of today condition the middle income trap in Central Europe. And by Central Europe, I mean the Czechia, Hungary, Poland, and Slovakia, which seem to, at least according to a academic debate, have a quite similar developmental model. And the first dependency is the one of the FDI, for indirect investment, originally coming from Western Europe and Germany above all. And this sort of dependency has been already quite densely researched, but currently it has become sort of less re reliable source of convergence hopes in the regions because in qualitative terms, it has been on a decrease since the global economic crisis. And the second one is the dependency on the EU funding, which is surprisingly less research, even though its significance has been gradually growing since the crisis and since entering the EU indeed. And these two types of economic transfers or investments are quite different, right? One is the private investment and the second is rather a public one. And my chapter is sort of interested in how the EU funding has been strategically instrumentalized in the economic strategies of these center European state. And it's especially uh, interested in how these have been sort of instrumentalized to produce uh, particular catch-up visions or developmental visions of overcoming uh, the middle income trap or avoiding it if some countries are still not there and sort of converging with the West, right? Through these, you know, already more than two decades old FDI-led models. And, uh, and another test of conversion. Yeah, and this slide sort of shows that two types of uh, strategies has actually developed in, in that region. Uh, the global strategies that were predominant in the 2000s before the crisis and the nationalist one that have been sort of uh, prevalent or emerging in this sort of like post-crisis 2000 dance. And the first strategies, they sort of emerged basically around the e EU accession and they sort of underpin the formation of these FDI-led models as we know now them know them down. That is sort of like manufacturing and export-oriented economies and sort of like subcontracting you know, second-rate Germans, right? The structure is quite similar, but it, these are really subcontracting economies on a sort of like European semi-periphery. And these strategies, they sort of consisted in expectation that sort of blending the FDI and the EU funds would make these countries a successful convergence models, just like, uh, for example, Ireland did in the 1980s and 1990s by basically mixing the FDI and e EU funds. So the story goes that they would be able to restructure the sort of like outdated socialist industrial heritage through the foreign direct investment, but at the same time modernize these backwards infrastructures that they inherited both physical and human through the EU funding and through all that they would somehow you know converge uh, with the West and this sort of like fairy tale had a sort of like bittersweet ending during the global economic crisis because these models they proved to be resilient to the crisis in a sense but at the same time it has become a general understanding in the region that they already sort of like reached the glass ceiling of a European, you know, economic, uh, let's say, distribution of labor. And that space sort of produced new type of state managers and new types of a, uh, of a economic programs that would more resemble, you know, economic nationalist rhetoric, right? The classical case is that today's uh, prime minister, Polish, uh, Mateusz Morawiecki, who has this discourse, right? And this sort of strategies, they sort of um, gave a new uh, purpose to the EU funding across the region, but Poland is the one of the uh, role models for that. Uh, 
and they no longer are simply sort of to feed the central European competition over uh, the foreign direct investment, but they are now rather to be invested into the domestic structures and into upgrading domestic firms so that they can be successful and grow uh, to become sort of like global leaders, right? That's the idea behind it. So it's a quite, quite paradoxical uh, because these states now want to use one dependency to replace the other, right? They want to use the EU funds. They become more dependent on the EU funds in order to become less dependent on a foreign direct investment. So I will conclude sort of with this that it's quite, even if you are sort of like economic nationalist on the, you know, sort of European periphery, you cannot avoid that fate of sort of a dependency, right? You can combine dependency, you can switch from one to another, but somehow you are in a sort of a vicious circle now. And the way how to break through is not really clear in that sense. And what I do in the chapter is also that I, you know, study the differences between this more like economic nationalist, economic nationalist rhetoric in Poland and Hungary. And as you know, sometimes it looks even as a non shift in Czech Republic and Poland uh, and Slovakia, where this sort of, let's say rhetoric is not resonant. So when we actually look at that rhetoric that is, you know, produced in Hungary and Poland, it's not really matching the reality because what's happening on the ground is still sort of uh, continuing um, efforts to win uh, for indirect investment, even though that one that is considered higher valued in a sense. But these strategies and I would say even the rhetoric, even though what's said about it has never been really about abandoning the FDI led model, more about diversifying it and not at all uh, leaving you know, the European structures in a sense. It has been, however, a sort of a quite strange strategy, again, paradoxical, because you, you are dependent on the EU funds, but at the same time, you want to sort of reintegrate into the EU market structures through that strategy on a more national terms than the, let's say, transnational terms that has been the trend in the 2000s. And I will close with that paradox. Thank you. I think it's a kind of a book of a paradox. <laughs> and um, I think this will be uh, the discussion later on, but uh, at the latest, uh, one of the authors, uh, Grzegorz Szczytowski, will uh, um, make the circle round. Yes, thanks. Thank you very much. I think I still need to close this one and switch to my presentation, right? I'll do it. First, and here I'll find mine, right? That's fine. That's a wonderful, wonderful new world. Hybrid, digital. Right. So I opened it here and, and then if you start it, then it automatically. Yes, but is it, this is not PowerPoint, so uh -huh. I cannot really start it. <laughs> if we need PowerPoint, I will need to. Oh, I can and make I it decide. full screen. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. And now, maybe we can make it full screen by clicking left off. Yeah. yeah. Right. One point is left. Uh, I guess. Is coming. Right. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I'm not seeing my slides now, but I think it's fine because I have a small number of them, so it's not that uh, bad. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. Thank you for this uh, fantastic discussion and for, for the great presentations before uh, from, from uh, to other colleagues which, uh, and other colleagues, which I think uh, will be complemented uh, well by, by, my, by the presentation of my own, which takes a more uh, micro level perspective on, on the development in, uh, in Central Eastern Europe, but focusing specifically on the Polish case. And um, my contribution to uh, the forthcoming book is a, a qualitative historical analysis. Sorry, I now would like to switch to the next slide, but I'm not sure if it will work. 
Make an arrow to the right. Right, right, right. That's it. That's it. So what I'm contributing to the book is a uh, qualitative historical analysis of upgrading strategies of two relatively successful IT companies from Poland. And the general assumption uh, in this study and how the study links to the discourse on the middle income trap was this, uh, is this, uh, that establishing competitive domestic firms in global technology sectors such as IT may uh, allow emerging countries in Eastern Europe, such as uh, Poland, to create opportunities for local value capture, which would be larger than uh, opportunities for local uh, value capture created by FDI. Uh, FDI very often focuses on re relocating tasks and productive activities from the value chain, which are relatively low value added and mostly labor intensive, while on the other hand, developing uh, innovative firms in technology sectors may help uh, the economies uh, capture the more uh, innovation intensive uh, segments of the value chains. So in my chapter, I focused on the historical development of two large enterprise IT firms from Poland. And in the table now on this slide, I'm showing some basic data about these two companies. You can see their names. Uh, these are Aseco and Komarch. And as the data in the table are in indicating, the companies have managed to achieve quite significant scales in terms of uh, both revenues and employment. Uh, and I think this is still a rather exceptional development in the Polish IT sector, and maybe even in the regional scale in Central European IT sector. And in addition to the data that, that I'm showing on the table, I can mention that both firms have developed strong positions in the domestic market for enterprise IT solutions, where they successfully compete with various multinational firms, such as IBM, Microsoft, Oracle, and others. Uh, although I will complement these points uh, uh, in a minute by, by pointing to a rather uh, uh, multinational technology sourcing strategies of this firm. So it's not only pure competition, but, uh, but also uh, including competition on the domestic market with the multinationals. And second, uh, another or maybe another indicator of their uh, successful development has been the fact that they have been able to enter into a number of uh, foreign and also including uh, many foreign uh, advanced uh, uh, markets in advanced economies, Western economies, including Germany, including France, as providers of enterprise IT solutions. So in total, there would be a number of indicators that, that suggest that they have been able to uh, uh, develop successfully uh, in the time period of around 30 years of their existence. Uh, but at the same time, and I must say this is a perspective that I have been developing when already doing this analysis, because my starting point was more the assumption that we, what, what I'm explaining here is a case of successful development. While when doing this analysis and gathering in-depth data about what the companies uh, uh, are doing and what are, for instance, their relations with foreign technology suppliers, I must say I, uh, I have to qualify this, this starting assumption and I'm increasingly emphasizing the fact that the companies have been able to develop relatively successfully because there's much uh, still to do uh, for them, for instance, in terms of uh, catching up technologically. So they have not really managed to become successful uh, technological innovators on the global scale. So they have not really introduced like their own proprietary uh, technological products for the labor uh, for, for, for the global market, such as products that you could com com uh, uh, source uh, from the globally established players, such as Oracle, etc. So they are not playing in the exactly same league as 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 the key global players. They are maybe on a uh, let's say uh, lower tier uh, and still dependent on key technology suppliers. I will I will um, elaborate on that uh, briefly in the later part of my analysis. So at the, at the end, what I have done in my analysis was to um, investigate the conditions that have enabled these firms to uh, relatively successfully develop throughout, uh, during the period of around 30 years of their existence. And this including also, as I have uh, just emphasized, explorations of the factors that might have limited their development, for instance, as technology innovators. And uh, so in my analysis, I gathered rich historical data on how the companies uh, uh, have managed uh, various uh, aspects of their, let's say, business models. And more specifically, I have focused on three dimensions, which I'm now showing on the screen. 
And these are these are my dimensions are first uh, a question of corporate uh, finance. And uh, here my uh, key finding is that both companies have been able to rely on the relatively well-functioning domestic capital market to, fin to finance their growth. Uh, both of them are listed on the Warsaw Stock Exchange and both of them uh, have been using uh, the capital collected in the, in the stock market to finance their growth and they were using uh, the money from the stock exchange for investments in new product development, investments in uh, on uh, production infrastructure facilities and for uh, mergers and acquisitions. And uh, regarding this last point, the, the mergers and acquisitions, this, this was a very important uh, mechanism that has allowed, for instance, the first uh, case study company, uh, ASECO, to develop very, very rapidly in terms of scale, in terms of uh, uh, organizational size. So uh, the company has developed through a number of uh, takeovers, both domestic and abroad, which were funded through the capital uh, collected uh, uh, on, the stock, on the stock exchange. And a very important role uh, here played also the involvement of foreign investors. Uh, who helped at least uh, in, in the early stage of the, of the company's development to, to, to push their agendas and to promote their companies uh, uh, and, collect, and collect money uh, through, through uh, um, issuing stocks on the Warsaw Stock Exchange. Okay, the second dimension of the analysis were uh, market positioning strategies. And here my main finding was uh, uh, the observation that the key role uh, at the early development of, of the two companies played the domestic market and the domestic market for uh, enterprise IT solutions, focusing more specifically on two uh, segments which were difficult to uh, to manage for the multinational competitors. And uh, the first sub-segment sub of this domestic market were uh, low-cost solutions for uh, domestic players, for domestic buyers, and uh, this included uh, enterprise IT solutions for SMEs, uh, where uh, multinational players such as uh, SAP and other and, uh, enterprise software producers were uh, had very uh, had re relatively weaker positions than the domestic players. And the second point that was interesting was uh, the the large share of uh, contracts from, from the public sector in, in, in the revenues of the two companies. And here I must say my observations are mixed re regarding how uh, conducive for the development towards uh, innovative uh, technology producers the, this uh, reliance on uh, contracts from the public sector has been at the end because what we were uh, observing here uh, specifically uh, in particular in, in early 90s and uh, 2000, uh, early 2000s was uh, a reliance on uh, public uh, procurement policies which were not entirely transparent and uh, not really uh, and rather uh, helped the companies win contracts through reliance on political connections etc. So but this maybe has already changed and uh, indeed uh, one indication of that uh, would be the, the new stricter and leaner policies which are which have been introduced around 2015 by the new conservative government, which made uh, this market segment uh, for domestic companies much difficult. Um, and now, the, finally, the third dimension uh, of my analysis explaining the, the relatively success, successful growth of the two steady companies have been uh, their integration into uh, global um, technology supply chains, the, the integration of the two companies into a global uh, technology supply chains governed by key US uh, American IT multinationals. And here I would mention first of all three, Oracle, IBM and Microsoft, who have been uh, providing uh, key, uh, let's say, components of the more systemic technologies that uh, were developed by, by the two Polish companies. And in companies, uh, the, the Polish companies used the, the, the component technologies, so let's say platform technologies, to build their solutions based on the components provided by the foreign partners. So it has been a sort of uh, global value chain directed from abroad to the domestic market. So it's not like the typical dimension from which you analyze the emerging ca country firm positions within GVCs, because usually you take the other perspective. The companies from emerging economies take the position of, uh, let's say, the 
the, 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 the more upstream uh, segments, which are then uh, uh, governed by the companies uh, and uh, channeled towards uh, developed country markets. And this is the opposite direction. So the, the target market at the beginning, at least, was, was the domestic market. And the foreign technology uh, producers were supplying their technologies, which were taken over and further developed by the domestic players uh, and sold uh, first, first of all, domestically. But uh, 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 throughout the development, I must emphasize the, the two companies have also diversified their their uh, market strategies in the sense that, that they also have managed to enter a number of um, foreign markets. So this this. Uh, Home market orientedness of these of these uh, global value chain strategies. This is characteristic mostly for the early stage of their development. Um, okay, that was actually the last dimension of my analysis. Here, let me emphasize maybe one point, which is mentioned here at the very bottom of, of my slide, but it's not maybe maybe perfectly now visible because it's hidden behind this uh, Adobe bar. But what it is saying is that this analysis has been uh, or is. Uh, largely focus on historical developments, also historical developments in the uh, enterprise IT industry, which is changing very dramatically and uh, very rapidly now. So what we are seeing is a situation that this uh, uh, established uh, uh, kinds of relationships between domestic companies and the global players is no longer that valid anymore because the technology changes and the sector shifts more towards cloud based technologies, which are very capital intensive. And the question remains open uh, in what way the domestic country players from countries like Poland will be able to integrate themselves into these uh, new uh, global value chain structures in sectors such as uh, enterprise uh, IT. OK, so uh, these were the insights from, from my chapter to this book. Thank you very much for your attention. And I'm looking forward to the discussion.